everyone. Today I'm going to be introducing how to annotate a text using Sutton's annotation system. It's the same system that you'll use in all grades in middle school and at North Atlanta High School. The first one is to underline, and that means if you underline something in a text that you're identifying a key word or phrase. So it's basically going to be the most important parts of the text or parts of the text that give you really important information. The next thing is to circle or write words in the margin. You're also going to use this a lot. It identifies major points like the main idea, maybe the theme, um, and also the most common way to use it is to circle words that you don't know and then writing a synonym or a definition next to it so that way you understand what you read. You're going to put a star if there's some sort of literary element or a rhetorical device like a key plot point, an allusion, even an onomatopoeia or another type of figurative language like a metaphor, simile, or idiom. You should definitely mark it as figurative language and if you know what type, you should put that as well. A bulleted list is really, really helpful, especially if you're reading a longer text or a text that's really confusing. Every so often, it could be every paragraph or every page, make a bulleted list at the side that just gives you a brief summary of the events that happened in that paragraph or that portion. React to what you're reading is something that you kind of do naturally. Basically, you would draw a heart, a smiley face, a sad face, or you know some sort of emoji that identifies your reaction to what you just read. Numbering each paragraph is essential for every text that you read in every class. Anytime that you're going to have to reference the text in writing, you're going to need to give the paragraph number where you got it. Writing in the margins is another thing that you're gonna do all the time. You could also just put a question mark if you're not sure about what's going on with that portion of the text. It'll draw your attention to it in class if you wanna ask what it's about or what was going on there. For today, I'm going to show you uh, annotation example with the story Tigress from Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. Personally, I like using a lot of color, so I'm going to be using colors, but you can annotate with just a pencil or whatever works for you. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the title of the story and the chapter it's in. Up here it says that it is from the chapter on love and kindness, and that kind of gives me a hint as to what I'm about to read. The title is Tigress, and it's not a word that we use all the time, so I'm trying to mentally think of what this could mean. Of course, it sounds like tiger, so I'm thinking tiger, and then when I see this ESS, it makes me think of like a princess, so like if a tiger plus S. I need to try to figure out what that is. And then you could also think about it like a prince versus a princess. So that makes me think of royalty, being strong. So I'm going to go ahead and um, identify that this is a strong, powerful female tiger. OK, the next thing is in italics. And it's a quote from somebody, but it's something we're going to need to break down. It says, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a harder battle. So I should just pause and kind of think about what that means and break it down. It's in kind of some old school language, so I really have to think about what it means. It's saying to be nice because everyone you meet is fighting a harder battle. So that's figurative language, so I'm going to go ahead and put a star, a star there because I don't think that they mean that every person that I meet is literally fighting a battle. They're, they're not. They're fighting something mentally, um, figuratively. So I guess that means um, I'm just going to kind of rephrase it down here for myself. Be nice because you never know what other people are going through. Okay, uh, next it says Plato, and that I kind of wonder about, like, who is Plato? So I'm going to put a question mark, but I'm also going to look it up on the computer and figure out who he is, because I don't know, is he the author of the story? Is he who said that quote? I'm not sure. Um, and after looking it up, I would learn that he is a Greek philosopher. So I'm going to just write that next to that, Greek philosopher. 
Okay, so now I can get into my story. I know it's going to have something to do with being kind to people because you don't know what they're going through. Um, so let's get started. It says, I'm not sure how Jesse got into my clinic. The first thing I wonder is, um, Jesse, I want to know if it's a boy or a girl. Like, I just wonder. So I'm going to put M or F, like male or female. And then it says clinic. So I'm also wondering what kind of clinic. And like, is, is Jesse sick? I don't know. He didn't look old enough to drive, although his body had begun to broaden, and he moved with the grace of young manhood. Okay. Um, he didn't look old enough to drive, and I know that in order to drive, you're 16-ish. So if he must be like somewhere in the 16 range, and his body had begun to broaden. And broaden, I'm in a circle because it's a kind of a newer word, and I'm going to put next to it that it means to grow or widen. Just like how when you get older, your shoulders kind of broaden. And he moved with the grace of young manhood. So grace um, would mean like smoothly. And manhood and he both tell me that Jesse is a male. So now we know the answer to that question. And it says his face was direct and open. I'm underlining that because it's it must be important, but I'm trying to figure out what direct and open face would look like. Um, I'm guessing that a face that weren't direct would be distracted, looking around, and a face that weren't open would be someone who didn't want to be talked to. So I'm guessing it means that he is focused and willing to listen. I just realized that I forgot a really important part of annotating. The first thing we should have done was number the paragraphs. So we're going to pause now and number those paragraphs. The easiest way to tell is the indention. So one, this one has an indent, two, three, four. Okay, this is a continuation of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Next page. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's a continuation of 17. 18, 19. Okay, this is interesting. You've got two indents in a row, so that must mean that we have two separate paragraphs here. So paragraph 19 only takes up one line. Every time that it switches from a person talking or thinking, it usually switches to a new paragraph right afterwards. So we have 21 total paragraphs. So now I'm going to go back to where I, I should have numbered those paragraphs right away. Okay, so I'm ready to move on to paragraph number two. And it says, when I walked into the waiting room, Jesse was lovingly petting his cat through the open door of the carrier on his lap. Okay, so now we know that the narrator is walking into the waiting room. I don't know if she is a patient or if she's a doctor or what? Um, I'm going to just put a question mark there because I'm wondering what she's doing there. Okay, the fact that Jesse was lovingly petting his cat through the open door on the carrier on his lap um, tells me something about Jesse's character. The fact that he's lovingly petting his cat through the carrier on his lap shows that he's comforting the cat, which gives me some indirect characterization, which just means instead of telling me that Jesse was an animal lover and a sweet kid, they told us by telling us that he was petting his cat on his lap. So I'm just going to put that he's sweet and um, loving. Okay, it also in the sentence told us that because there's a cat there, it must be a veterinary clinic because, I mean, how often have you been to a doctor's office where someone brings a cat? It's possible, but that tells us it's a vet's office. Okay, the next sentence says, with the schoolboy's faith in me, he had brought his sick cat in for me to mend. All right, this is kind of an interesting thing. Schoolboy's faith in me. I need to think about what that means. Okay, so having faith in someone means having trust or belief, and a schoolboy would have, I'm trying to think if a schoolboy would have more or less faith in a person. And I think, I'm thinking more. Um, 
because if you're a kid like you know seven or eight and somebody tells you something you're pretty gullible you'll believe you know just about anything an adult or a teacher tells you so a schoolboy's faith in me would mean that he had tons of trust in this person in the narrator and he had brought his sick cat in for her to mend so now we know that the cat is sick and the word mend is kind of new so I would have looked that up and figured out that it meant to fix now you'll see that there's all these lines and things like it's kind of messy looking that's common for annotating and that's okay they there's not a lot of space on the paper so I have to use the space that I have okay the next paragraph uh, paragraph three the cat was a tiny thing exquisitely formed with a delicate skull and beautiful markings so we've got a couple of new words here words that may not be familiar so I'm going to circle exquisitely and delicate because that's kind of an interesting word to use to describe a skull and beautiful markings okay so I can kind of use context clues to tell that you know exquisitely formed and, and beautiful markings that she must be a, a good-looking cat so exquisitely would be like beautifully perfectly she was just a great specimen, a good-looking cat. Um, a delicate skull. That's weird because this is an animal. So to say that it has a delicate skull, I'm sure that the narrator means that it's small and dainty and, you know, but it really means that it's fragile and easily breakable. And not that we're thinking about that, but that's basically what it's saying, that if um, you weren't really careful with her, you know, you could basically break her. She looked like she was about 15 years old. Wow. Okay, so that, I, I have a reaction to that because that's pretty old, um, even for a cat. So I'm going to draw like a wow emoji. Or I could just write the word wow, either way. Okay, so she looked like she was about 15 years old, give or take a year. Okay, that's something that we might read in not really think about what it means. But right up here, I'm going to kind of go through that. So if the cat's 15 and you give a year, then the cat would be 16. If the cat's 15 and you take a year, then the cat would be 14. So the cat has to be somewhere between 14 and 16 years old, according to the vet. So that is almost, sounds exactly like the same age range of Jesse, because he, he's somewhere around 16, so he's probably 14 to 16 as well. Okay, so that gives us some more information. I could see how her spots and stripes and her fierce, bright face had evoked, okay, that's, let's circle that, the image of a tiger in a child's mind, and tigress she had become. All right, we need to break down that paragraph. Um, so the narrator sees the spots and stripes and her fierce, which I guess means um, confident, strong, feisty, bright face had evoked. Okay, so if I looked up evoked, I would find out that it means um, to bring on or to spark. So it brought out the image of a tiger in a child's mind. So she's picturing Jesse as a child or any child looking at um, this cat and seeing a tiger. Uh, so that she figures that's where she got the name. But here it says, and tigress she had become. Okay, let's read the whole sentence again. I could see how her spots and stripes and her fierce, bright face had evoked to bring on her spark, brought out the image of a tiger in a child's mind, and tigress she had become. Okay, now this is an example of figurative language. Because she didn't, like, literally overnight go from a house cat to a tiger um, to a what we figured out up here was a strong, powerful female tiger. That is a metaphor for, you know, they're basically... Sometimes you're used to metaphors that's just like, the cat is a tiger. That's a basic elementary metaphor. This is a little bit deeper. Um, tigress she had become. So she had gone from house cat to a powerful, strong tiger, which is not literally true, so it's figurative language, so we put a star next to it. Age had dimmed the bright green fire of her eyes, and there was a dullness there now, but she was still elegant and self-possessed. Okay, so dimmed, if I think about even lighting, if you dim the lights, they get darker. So, get darker. Um, so, because she's older, her, um, kind of the fire in her eyes 
has gone out and gotten darker. Um, and again, this is figurative language because the cat doesn't literally have green fire in her eyes. Her eyes are green. And the fire is like life or youth or excitement for life. Um, and there was a dullness there now. So you might have thought like, okay, maybe it's literal that maybe this cat's eyes have kind of clouded over like old animals get, but really the narrator is just trying to say that because the cat's gotten older, she's not as vibrant and full of life. But she was still elegant and self-possessed. The word elegant, um, we kind of know it's like soft, pretty, and then self-possessed, that's kind of a word we don't use very often. So we know self means self, but possessed, when I think about that, to be honest with you, I think of like horror movies where something takes control of another person. But also the word possession uh, means to own something. So if she's self-possessed, she's still independent, confident, and she can still care for herself is the way I read that. So she's probably still, um, you know, able to go to the litter box and clean herself and all those kind of things. She greeted me with a friendly rub against my hand. So we just know that she's, you know, sweet. I put a smiley face in the margin there. I had began to ask questions to determine what had brought these two to see me. All right, so this tells us that since she's asking the questions, the narrator, that she must be a vet or a vet tech. Um, so she asked questions like, you know, probably what's going on with your cat? Unlike most adults, the young man answered simply and directly. Okay, so if he answers simply and directly, that would mean, you know, in plain words and just straightforward. So I'm kind of wondering what she means by unlike most adults. And the way that I read that is that if the young man answers simply, like in just a few words, and says exactly what he means, then that would mean that most adults beat around the bush and tell these really long stories. So if you think about it, Jesse probably just came right out and said what was going on with his cat, but an adult would have said, the cat meow, and I walked over to her, and on and on and on. And the vet is trying to say that this is different, that the young man just answered her right away. So this is the explanation for what's going on with Tigris. Tigris had had a normal appetite. An appetite means like a want to eat. Until recently. Recently means lately. When she'd begun to vomit a couple of times a day. Okay, so now we know that the cat is, is ill. Um, so that I have a sad reaction to that. Now she was not eating at all and was withdrawn and sullen. Okay, withdrawn, um, you should probably know that word, but to pull away from, to get away from, so probably not spending as much time with the family or with Jesse. And sullen means sad or gloomy. She had also lost a pound, which is a lot when you weigh only six. So she's lost a sixth of her body weight, and that's, you know, quite a bit. So, surprised face. Stroking Tigress, I told her how beautiful she was while I examined her eyes and mouth, listened to her heart and lungs, and felt her stomach. Okay, so the vet says that she's telling the cat how beautiful she is while she's examining her. So that tells me something about the narrator. It tells me that she likes animals, right? I mean, we, we should assume that she likes animals, but we all know people who don't like their jobs, even though they work at them. So she could have been a, a vet that was, you know, not super caring. But telling the cat that she's beautiful while she's examining her shows that she wants to put the cat at ease and that she likes her job. So she examines her, and then I found it. Okay, so I'm already nervous. Um, like, and then I found it, I'm wondering like, oh gosh, what'd they find? A tubular mass in mid-abdomen. Okay, tubular. All right, tubular has a couple of different meanings. You might be thinking of like the old 80s, uh, totally tubular, awesome, radical kind of thing, but obviously that's not what they mean here. Um, but the root word of tubular is tube, so I'm going to just, you know, it's tube-shaped. So I'll just write that there. Um, so she found a tube-shaped mass in the mid-abdomen. 
Okay, well, from science, I know that mass is something that takes up space. So this is like a lump. Um, and lump, a lump in the body would be made up of, um, you know, it's not a hairball or anything like that. It's like tissue um, and cells and things like that. In mid-abdomen, okay, in mid-abdomen, of course, is middle of the stomach. Tigress politely tried to slip away. Politely. Okay, this get, tells me something about tigress. Tigress could have clawed, scratched, hissed, whatever, attacked, ran away from the vet, but instead she politely tries to slip away. It tells us again what a sweet cat tigress is. She did not like the mask being handled. So that also tells us that she's in pain. Paragraph 7. I looked at the fresh-faced teen and back at the cat he had probably had all his life. So she's starting to think about how Jesse has had this cat in his life ever since he can remember and how sad that is that she's going to have to break news to him that something's wrong. I was going to have to tell him that his beloved companion, so that means a, you know, a friend or a partner that he loves, um, had a tumor. Okay, a lot of times when we hear the word tumor, we immediately think of cancer, but not all tumors are made up of cancer. But in a cat, um, this is not good news. So it, it probably is cancer, um, and we're going to put that there. But because you don't really hear about, I mean, animals do get benign tumors, but the fact that it's in the abdomen and it's affecting her appetite means that it probably is cancer. Even if it were surgically removed, so even if it were taken out, she probably would survive less than a year. Oh, that's sad. It might need weekly chemotherapy to last that long. All right, chemotherapy is a word that unfortunately most of us are familiar with, but um, let's look at the root, C-H-E-M, and I think of the words chemistry, chemical, and then the word therapy is a treatment, so it's like a chemical treatment. And what it really is is they um, pump a uh, mix of chemicals into your body to kill cancer cells, and unfortunately it also kills some of your good cells so it, you can have a bad reaction to it like a loss of hair fingernails toenails things like that it makes you feel sick it's not a pleasant experience um, so even if even if she does last a year she's gonna have to go through weekly chemotherapy that's rough it would have been all been okay paragraph eight it would all be very difficult and expensive okay so if you have a pet you know um, your parents have probably told you how expensive it is to care for a pet. So I was going to have to tell him that his cat was likely to die, and there he was, all alone. Okay, so a couple of things here. Um, the word die, it, it's just a really strong word. She didn't say pass away um, or anything like that. She said die, and that's strong. Um, it has a very negative connotation. Uh, it gives a very negative feeling to the reader. And there he was all alone. Another feeling of sadness um, that he's going through this by himself. Sad for the cat and sad for Jesse. It seemed he was about to learn one of life's toughest lessons. Okay, that right there, I mean, toughest lessons. I can tell that they're about to say something important. That death is something that happens to every living thing. Okay. That's a powerful statement. I'm just going to kind of soak that in. Death is something that happens to every living thing. So everything that's alive is eventually going to die. Now I've heard there's, you know, some animals, jellyfish, that can regenerate and live forever, but everything that was living once will pass away. Um, so that that's a really hard lesson to learn, and it kind of makes me feel like it might be part of the theme of the story. So I'm just gonna kind of put a star and like question mark and, and put theme, because I'm wondering if that's like what I'm supposed to learn from this story. Um, because the theme is the lesson that any person can learn from reading this story. Um, it is an omnipresent part of life. Okay, omnipresent is an unfamiliar word. If I look at the root, omni, that would mean um, always, and present means around or, you know, the now, so it's all around part of life. So it's something that's always there. It's always hanging over us that everything is going to die. 
how death is first experienced can be life forming. And it seemed that I was going to, ha to be the one to guide him through his first. Okay. Um, so this is just depressing, but basically she feels like Jesse's probably never lost a pet or hopefully has never lost a, a person in his life. And the first experience you have with that is life changing. It determines, you know, how you handle death in the future. Um, unfortunately, a lot of you have lost pets and you know how devastating that can be. And she's concerned that she's going to have to be the one that guides him through p dealing with the death of his cat. I did not want to make any mistakes. It had to be done perfectly or he might end up emotionally scarred. Okay, so um, had to be done perfectly, again, shows me that she likes her job and that she really cares to make sure she delivers this message the right way so that she doesn't mess Jesse up for the rest of his life. Um, and that's what emotionally scarred would be. Scarred looks a lot like scared, except it has two R's in it. Um, and I'm just gonna write permanent in the margin because, um, you know, she's saying that she might, like, seriously, permanently, emotionally mess him up. Okay, paragraph 10. It would have been easy to shirk this task and summon a parent. All right, we've got two words there that are kind of new and interesting, shirk and summon. To shirk something, um, you know, I mean, we can use context clues. It would have been easy to shirk this task and summon a parent. Um, so it sounds like she's saying it would have been easy to not do it, like to just like say, oh, I'll be right back and then go call his dad or his mom or something. So I'm just going to put not do this task and summon a parent. Um, summon means to bring forward, to bring about, um, to call apparent. Um, but when I looked at his face, I could not do it. He knew something was wrong. I could not just ignore him. So I talked to Jesse as Tigress's rightful owner and told him as gently as I could what I had found and what it meant. Okay, so we know what she found. She found a tumor and unfortunately it meant death. All right, so before we turn the page, I want to kind of do the bulleted list that tells what uh, what's happened in this chapter. Or, I'm sorry. Before I turn the page, I'm going to look at what has happened on these two pages, so that way I can look back if I've forgotten. Because when you're annotating, you're, you're really reading slow and closely, so you kind of need to review and write down what has gone on. <clears throat> So you need to review and write down what's gone on so far. All right, so we've got this kid named Jesse with a cat named Tigress, and they're at the vet. Um, the doctor's the narrator, and uh, doctor finds tumor. Uh, the doctor realizes that the cat is gonna die, or it's going to be a, a not good experience. And she decides to tell him without telling us, you know, without calling a parent. So she's really being um, brave and uh, is going to tell Jesse herself. As I spoke, Jesse jerked convulsively. Okay, so convulsively away from me. Um, the word jerked makes me think that he just pulled away really quickly and kind of just jerked his body really fast and kind of just turned away maybe to show that, you know, he was, uh, so that she couldn't see his reaction. Probably so I couldn't see his face, so yeah, I was right. Um, but I had seen it begin to twist as he turned. So his face is twisting. Um, that's kind of figurative language. I mean, it's not like literally twisting, but his face is starting to turn to the face we make when we cry. I sat down and turned to Tigris to give Jesse some privacy and stroked her beautiful old face while I discussed the alternatives with him. I could do a biopsy of the mass, let her fade away at home, or give her an injection to put her to sleep. All right, let's break this sentence down. 
So the doctor sits down, probably to get on the same level as Jesse. Um, she turns to Tigress, so that way she's not looking at Jesse. So instead of you know, looking Jesse in the face and making him uncomfortable because he's probably crying, um, she decides to look at the cat, which is a really, again, nice thing to do. Um, she doesn't want to make him feel weird about crying. So she pets the cat and tells Jesse about what else could happen. She could do a biopsy, which is um, bio is life, and that root word there. So she, she could go in and look at the look at the mass that we already decided that was like a, a lump and determine what it is and see if it's cancer or not cancer. Um, but she knows it's likely cancer. Um, <clears throat> Jesse could choose to take her home and just let her pass away at home, or um, the doctor could give an injection and put her to sleep. So put to sleep is figurative language that we're pretty used to, um, and that means to, you know, basically euthanize a dog. Um, and euthanize means to, um, all I have is other figurative language words, put down. It basically means kill, but in a humane way. Um, we all have different words that we use to make ourselves feel better about death, uh, but then at the end of the day, she would be giving a lethal injection, a deadly injection to the cat, um, in order to make it more comfortable and stop the pain. Jesse listened carefully and I nodded. Jesse listened carefully and nodded. He said he didn't think she was very comfortable anymore, and he didn't want her to suffer. All right, so again, this Jesse guy is really sweet. Um, he, you know, it makes me sad that he's having to go through this. And instead of, you know, being selfish and wanting to take the cat home and love on her until she passes away, he doesn't want her to feel any more pain. He was trying very hard. The pair of them broke my heart. All right, that's another figurative language. That's an idiom. Um, it's a phrase we use. Um, we know that literally um, a human heart can't break. I offered to call a parent to explain what was going on. Jesse gave me his father's number. I went over everything again with the father while Jesse listened and petted his cat. Then I let the father speak to his son. Jesse paced and gestured, and his voice broke a few times. Okay, so paced is to, you know, walk back and forth. Usually it's like a nervous kind of thing. Gestured um, is like a hand motion. So he's, he's walking back and forth, he's making hand motions, and his voice broke a few times. So, you know, voices break for different reasons, but in this case it's because he's upset, he's been crying, he is crying, so he's having a hard time even getting words out. But when he hung up, he turned to me with dry eyes, so him having dry eyes shows that he's brave and strong, and said that they had decided to put her to sleep. And that's another brave and strong thing to have to do, to say, you know, we're going to go ahead and let her go before she has to go through any more pain. No arguing, no denial, no hysteria. Hysteria is like freaking out, like going crazy. Um, crazy. Uh, just acceptance of the inevitable. Inevitable is kind of a new word. Inevitable means like guaranteed to happen in the future. Um, I could see, though, how much it was costing him. Okay, costing him. I'm going to put a star by that because to me that's figurative language. I mean, it's not, like, it's not costing him dollars. I mean, it will cost dollars, but that's not what she means. She means it's costing him his, you know, like his emotions. It's taking an emotional toll on him. It's costing him feelings. I asked if he wanted to take her home overnight to say goodbye, but he said no. And so I, I kind of wondered, like, why did he say no? Like, why would he not want to take her home for one more night? I have to figure it's for one of two reasons. Either it would be too painful for Jesse to say goodbye at home or to bring her back um, or to even just have to say goodbye like that, or he didn't want the cat to be in pain for another second. Um, so he said no. He just wanted to be alone with her for a few minutes. So that's a normal thing, too. Veterinarians usually ask if you want to be alone with your pet to say goodbye, and this is just so sad. Um, and I'm sure if you've lost a pet, this is bringing up some sad memories, and I'm sorry about that. But like the last page said, um, 
death is a part of life and every living thing dies and we all experience it and that's really what chicken soup for the teenage soul is all about sharing experiences that we all have I left them and went to sign out the barbiturate I could use to ease her into a painless sleep okay um, oh, I would use all right barbiturate um, we're going to use context clues here so she leaves the room she goes to sign it out so she this is something she has to sign out and if you think about the things that you have to sign out like a Chromebook or a library book like it's something that's controlled something that you can't just take and use without you know signing out so she signs something out and it's something that she's going to use to ease her into a painless sleep. So it has to be that injection that she mentioned earlier. So this is a drug that will put the cat um, to rest to death. So um, drug. I'm sorry to use such crass language like death and all of that, but I mean, we have really, when you're annotating, you really do have to think about what is being said here and face the reality of the story. I could not control the tears streaming down my face. Okay, again, showing that the vet um, is empathetic, um, and we should know the word empathy from social emotional learning, but empathy um, is when you can like imagine walking in someone else's shoes and feel their pain. So sh she's crying. Um, okay, welling up just kind of means growing inside, like getting bigger, more prominent. So she felt welling up inside for Jesse who had become a man so quickly and so alone so she feels bad for him he's had to grow up like in a matter of minutes she has just you know aged him by telling him what's gonna happen I waited outside the exam room in a few minutes he came out and said that he was ready I asked if he wanted to stay with her he looked surprised so it's a kind of a common thing. Um, the first time you put an animal down, I mean, you're not really sure what it's going to look like or what it's going to be like. Um, and of course, he's surprised. He's like, really? You, I would be in the room for this? But I explained that it was often easier to observe how peaceful it was than to forever wonder how it actually happened. OK, that's, that's powerful. So she doesn't want him like staying up at night wondering, you know, what did Tigress go through? after I left the room was she upset did she cry you know did she feel pain um, so staying in the room would help him see how painless and how peaceful the whole process is immediately seeing the logic of that okay logic is kind of an unfamiliar word um, we can use context clues as well Immedi immediately seeing the logic of that Jesse held her head and reassured her while I administered the injection okay so logic so Jesse's gonna stay in the room Jesse holds her so if Jesse sees the logic of it then it means that he sees the sense of it he understands what the doctor's saying and he agrees that it's probably would be a good idea to stay and see how peaceful it was so Jesse holds her head and reassures her so what would reassuring the cat look like it would probably be like saying it's okay you know maybe saying I love you everything's gonna be all right while well, I administered the injection okay an injection is a shot administered think about when your teacher administers the milestone test administered means to give so immediately seeing the sense of you know staying in the room and watching Jesse holds the cat's head and tells her it's okay while the uh, doctor gives the shot that's going to put the cat to sleep so as you see annotating this has really helped us understand it really deeply like we don't just get that okay the cat's gonna be put to sleep we understand the details of the word choices and you know saying administered an injection those are very like sterile doctor words that don't have a lot of emotion um, and that's because it's it's so simple and so quick that it is very sterile and very doctor like she drifted off to sleep her head cradled in his hand that makes me sad for both of them but also kind of happy it's it's strange like it makes me happy that Jesse got to hold her head and it makes me happy for the cat that Jesse was there 
when in that moment instead of being at home you know if they had taken the cat home and it had passed alone Jesse might have felt sad about that but the fact that he's there you know it's, it's very sad but it's also kind of happy um, the word cradled uh, think for a second about what you think of when you think of the word cradled or cradle I think of a baby so even though this cat is you know 14 to 16 years old um, it, it when it passed away it was just like when she was a baby um, curled up in Jesse's hand that's very sad the animal looked quiet and at rest the owner now bore all the suffering all right, the word bore. Um, we think of bore as like boring, but in this case, bore means to take on the suffering. So instead of the cat suffering, now the owner is going to suffer, and the owner's Jesse. Um, the fact that she used the word owner instead of Jesse makes me feel like now we're talking about like every time she does this. Now it's the owner feeling the pain instead of the animal. This was the finest gift you could give, I said, to assume another's pain so that a loved one might rest. Okay, that's a great sentence. This was the finest gift you could give. Okay, so to call it a gift seems very odd. Um, to say that, you know, death could be a gift is an interesting statement, but really it's not death it's like a relief of pain so relieving the cat of the suffering is is truly a gift um, and she is assuming I mean, I'm sorry she's saying that for Jesse to assume another's pain so for Jesse to assume which to take on another which is tigress's pain so that a loved one might rest all right, so the finest gift that Jesse could give would be to take on Tigress's pain so that Tigress won't be suffering anymore. That sounds very much like a theme as well, like a lesson that we're supposed to learn from this story. So I think that's a really important part. So I'm going to kind of like box it out and put a star by it because I think it is part of the theme maybe. He nodded. He understood. So he understands, but is it going to make him feel any better? No. He's still going to be sad. He's still going to have to go through the things that we go through when we lose something or someone. So I don't know. It's just it's still sad. But he's being brave and mature. He's not, like, crying or huddled in a corner or anything. Something was missing, though. I did not feel I had completed my task. So she had said earlier that she wanted it to be perfect, and now she feels like something was missing and that she didn't do what she set out to do. Her task was to make Jesse feel okay about losing his cat. It came to me suddenly that I thought I had asked him to become a man instantly. It came to me suddenly that though I had asked him to become a man instantly, and he had done so with grace and strength, he was still a young man. All right, that, we need to break that down. All right, so it comes to her, so it, mentally it pops into her mind, that she asked him to t be a man instantly. Um, that's figurative language. She didn't, you know, she wasn't literally saying like, you're a man. Um, it's clearly figurative that he had to grow up essentially by learning this lesson. Um, he had done so with grace and strength, and he was still a kid. He's still a teenager. I mean, I know you guys aren't kids, but um, you know you're not you're not fully grown. You're not an adult yet. So he was really brave, as she tells this teenager this horrible truth about life. I held out my arms and asked if he needed a hug. He did. I held out my arms and asked him if he needed a hug. He did indeed, and in truth, so did I. It's a great ending to the story. So he needed a hug, but so did she. Um, I feel like that's just really sweet, that the doctor cared enough to also you know, need comforting after that experience. If you can imagine being a doctor, uh, how hard it must be when you lose a patient, um, and then having to tell the family, you know, I, I think it's it's really, a nice moment here where she you know needs comforting as well as Jesse. Okay, now we have this name here, Judith S. Judith S. 
So we have a name here, Judith S. Jonesi. Um, so we know she's a female, and I don't know if we knew that before. Um, it could have been a male doctor. Uh, I don't know why, I just assumed she was a female, but in these chicken soup stories, it's often helpful to look at the end to see who wrote the story first, so you can tell if the narrator is male or female, because they're all from the first person point of view. So now, I thought that all the stories in Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul were written by teens, but is Judith a teen? It's like, I should ask myself that. How could she be a teenager and a doctor? Um, I mean, there's always like Doogie Hauser, if you've ever seen that, like a really young prodigy child who goes through college early and becomes a doctor. It was very unlikely, um, and she probably would have mentioned that. So it sounds like she's an adult um, and a doctor. So, you know, this story was not written from the perspective of a teen, but it was written, you know, through the teen's eyes in a way. She, she tells the teen's story for him. All right, so now that we're done, we should make a bulleted list that just kind of summarizes the story um, and gives us, you know, like a main idea is, I guess, what we're looking for, a main or a central idea, which is really like a one-sentence summary of what the story was about. So I think the story, um, I need to mention Jesse, Tigress, the doctor, the vet, and the cat, what happened with the cat. So the main central idea would be... Um, a boy, uh, a teenage boy, uh, learns the hard lesson of death. Um, I'm going to say loss. A teenage boy learns a, uh, the hard lesson of loss when he takes his cat to the vet. So that is one sentence that really does cover the whole story. A teen boy learns a hard lesson, the lesson of loss, when he takes his cat to the vet. Now we need to come up with a theme. We really need to think about, like, what lesson were we supposed to learn from this story? Now, it has to be a lesson that anyone could learn from this story, not just... Um, you, not just a teenager, not just cat owners, not just boys or veterinarians. It has to apply to everyone. So for me, the theme would be something about life and death. And, you know, I, I look back at the sentence where it says, like, the finest gift you could give is to assume another's pain so that a loved one might rest. That very well could be the theme. I could put that down as the theme and it would be correct. Um, I'm going to kind of put it in my own words, but I guess it would be that... Um, Uh, everything living will die, but the best gift you can give is to let them go. So they won't suffer any longer. To me, that's the theme. Themes can, you know, different people can see themes different ways, but at the end of the day, it's pretty clear that the story is about the lesson of life and death and, you know, how it affects you and how different people come up with different themes, but it definitely should have something to do with life and death and, um, you know, that giving that making a decision like that is, is actually a gift. All right, thanks for watching, and keep in mind that every time you annotate a document, it's going to be a little different. Everyone annotates differently. You're not always going to have the exact same marks, but you should definitely make sure that you are underlining very important parts, circling words you don't know, putting stars next to literary devices and figurative language, and breaking down the text um, and, and using bullet points to kind of figure out what the text was about.